He really didn't need that. So being polite. All right. Open your Bibles to the book of Second Timothy this morning. Second Timothy chapter one. And um, they do want us to give a little bit of a of a bio. My name is Ted Fellows. I'm the pastor of the Brian Bible Church in Louisville, Ohio. I've been pastoring there since February of 1990, and uh, we have a ministry there. We have uh, a dear group of saints, and uh, we just appreciate the opportunity to minister minister here. I am one of the original. I am an original. Um, sometimes that's good. Sometimes that's not. Ba- you know the um, in the um, when you talk about the doctrine of preservation, the copies are just as good as the originals, aren't they? And uh, we're glad that we've got a lot of copies because the originals eventually wear out. <laughs> Marvin's got that song, doesn't he? And, uh, uh, but we're glad to, uh, to have the Ministry of Grace School of the Bible and the friendships that we've developed over the years, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity to minister. Okay, I want to be sure to start this, and I don't want to hit the clear. Uh, it won't start, so I guess I... There we go. I just cleared it. All right. All right. Well, I'll behave myself. I got, I got my own clock here, so I'll, I'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we won't put too much um, stress on the nursery folks. Open your Bible, if you haven't already, to book, book of 2 Timothy chapter number... 2 Timothy chapter number... One, and my message this morning is holding fast the form of sound words. Let's read 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Have a word of prayer and begin this morning. Father, we thank you. Um, let's read the verse first. Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Father, we thank you for this Uh, This week, and those that have labored to to put the week together, thank you for all the work that goes on behind the scenes, the ministry with the children. We thank you for the saints that uh, are are here for this weekend and for the the days following, for those that are watching at home. Lord, we just thank you for this great privilege to open up your word and and look into these eternal truths. And we pray that, uh, that the Holy Spirit would take these truths and impart life to us as we hold forth the word of life. We thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. It's amazing. I appreciated what Brother John did last night, talking about the very words of God, holding forth the word of life, that God's word is life. The very words themselves have life in them. There, it, and uh, the, um, the, when, you, when you study the Bible, looking at the words, and the words being the issue on the page, it opens up so many things because there's so many details. Brother Morris likes to talk about the details in the Scripture. Rome, uh, 2 Timothy 1 verse 13 here doesn't say, hold forth the words. He doesn't, he do, it doesn't say, hold fast the word, the message. He says, hold fast the words. He doesn't say, hold fast the Word, the whole Bible. We know the whole Bible is profitable. We know that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. The the passage here is very, very specific. He says, hold fast the form of sound words. So there's a form of the sound words, but there's also a source of 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 the sound words. We know that God the Holy Spirit wrote the Scripture but also that the human source in the passage here is the Apostle Paul. He says, hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me. And then it's how we're to hold fast those form of sound words in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. And then as he he lays these, these wonderful specific things out, he says it again, verse number 14, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep. By the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. There is a form of sound words that we need to keep, that we need to guard, that we need to protect, that we need to hold on to. And as we have it, then we hold it forth. He says these words, there's a form of the words. There is a form of sound words. These are healthy words. Words that that will produce life and health and and, and spiritual growth and, and strength and encouragement. And there's this wonderful truth here that we have 
we have the word of God. We have all of, 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 of the word of God. It's all profitable. But here in 2 Timothy, you know the verse, the Bible has to be held and has to be taught and handled and preached and proclaimed the right and the proper way. We have to rightly divide. We have to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There's the whole message, but with the whole message, there are natural divisions and distinctions to recognize. So there's a, there's a specific way that we have to handle the Bible. Sound words, healthy words. He's, the, the Lord says that they that are, that are whole need not a physician. There's, there, there's healthy words here that we need to hold forth. Um, take, your, take your Bible here and go, go back to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter number 1. There are other words in the Bible... It's all profitable, it's all God's words, but if you don't handle the Bible the right way, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you can take the word of God, we heard last night from Brother John, and you can do damage to people. You can cause problems, and instead of producing health and life and and joy and strength and comfort, you can produce devastation in, in, in life. The Apostle Paul here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Well, there's other doctrine in the Scripture, is there not? So he says, teach no other doctrine. There's a specific doctrine, there's a specific truth that needs to be proclaimed and held and stood for and, and kept today. He says, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. I call the first half of that verse spiritual junk food. You hear people out there, they get fed, they have spiritual food, fables and stories, but it's not godly edification. It's not healthy doctrine. And it's, it, a lot of it isn't even junk food. I mean, you could eat junk food and you get some calories and you can have some strength and you can go on in that. But a lot of the stuff out there is poison and it brings death and it brings discouragement and and it brings harm (coughs) the apostle paul here says he says neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith so do rather than things that minister questions rather than unhealthy doctrine other doctrine Paul's goal here is godly edifying. Edifying and and building up the saints. That word edifying there means to build up a house, to construct a building. And he he goes on to say in verse number, number five, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. Now, the commandment here in in 1 Timothy is something very important. If you go back to to verse number one, 1 Timothy chapter number one, verse one, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by what? By the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. The the commandment is the commission that that God Almighty gave through Jesus Christ to the Apostle Paul to, to go out with his ministry and preach and proclaim the gospel of the grace of God, to talk about the fall of the nation of Israel and the raising up of the church, the body of Christ, and a new new purpose. And that commandment was was the, the authority that the Apostle Paul possessed from God himself through Jesus Christ. There's an end game. He says the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and a good conscience and faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Now, is the law God's words? God's words... The law given through Moses, are those healthy, sound words? They are in the right context. He says the law is good if a man use it lawfully. But you can take the law and you can take other doctrine in the word of God and you can subvert the souls of believers. This whole issue of sound doctrine here, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. You can take the law... And instead of producing life with people, you can produce death. Now, David, David, an Old Testament saint, a man, not this David. I happen to look. (laughs) Not David Reed, David in the Old Testament. (laughs) David was a man after God's own heart. Did he love the law? 
He says in Psalm 119, Oh, how I love thy law. It's my meditation all the day. It was, it was a beautiful thing. It was, it was light to his path and, and food to his soul. It was a wonderful thing that David rejoiced in. And yet the law, the Apostle Paul says, he says in Romans chapter 7, go over, go over there quickly, I don't want to misquote it, Romans chapter 7, that, that Paul, he says, I was alive without the law once. Romans chapter 7, verse number Verse number 9, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment that was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. The law that, that David rejoiced in, that was his meditation all the day, Paul here says, I was alive without it once, but then the commandment came. And instead of producing life, what did it do? It slew me. The Apostle Paul had further revelation about the grace of God and about, about life in Christ Jesus. And here, the, the, the law, if, if God's Word is not handled properly, the law, which is God's Word, living Word, he calls it in Second Corinthians the ministration of what? Death and the ministration of condemnation. So how we handle God's Word is vitally important. Who's the law for, we learn from the Apostle Paul? It's for the unrighteous and the ungodly. Now we know that, that what things serve the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty. The law was a schoolmaster to reveal sin, not to overcome it. And that was, a, that was an important lesson. But here, this, this issue of, of godly edifying, there is a form of sound words. If you go back, we, we go back to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me. What's the human source? We know it's Paul's gospel. It's the gospel of the grace of God. It's the word of God that God committed unto him. He says in chapter 2 that um, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. We know it's Paul's gospel. And there's multitudes of grace believers today that understand that Paul is our apostle and that we need to hold fast his message and his truth. But you know something? That's not enough. Second Timothy or chapter 1, verse 13 here, it says, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me. There's a form and a shape. There's a pattern to follow in the administrating of these words. And um, that, that there's, a, there's a great truth, and it produces godly edification. Come with me to the book of Matthew, chapter number 7. There's, a, there's an illustration that I've, I've long loved to use. That word edifying means to build, means to construct. Brother Frank was talking about that house of doctrine that needs to be built up in your soul. There's a, there's a, there's a body of truth, but there's the way that it, it, it is to be put together. When you build a building, you have to, you have to there's an order. First, you have to have the blueprints, and then you have to construct the building in the proper order. What do you start with with a building? You start with a foundation. If you're lucky enough, like me, fortunate enough, um, to be raised in a Christian home, there's a story here in Matthew chapter number 7 and verses 24 through 29 about the wise man and the foolish man. And the Lord says here, verse 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon a rock. You know the song, the wise man built his house upon the rock, and the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down, and the floods came up, and the rain came down, and the floods came up, and the house on the rock stood firm. <coughs> then there's the other side of the coin in verse number um, 26. He says, and everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. The wise man and the foolish man built his house. That word built there, it's the same idea. It's constructing a house, but here it's constructing some truth. The Lord says, you listen to the things that I'm saying and when the storm comes... You'll have, you'll have some stability and you'll have some strength and the floods will come and the rains will descend and the house will stand. 
What's, the, what's the, the flood and the storm that's coming for these believers here? It's the 70th week of Daniel and the day of the Lord. And the Lord is teaching those individuals about how to stand and, and, and the, the, the gospel of the kingdom. Building a house on a rock or building a house on, a, on the sand. I had the, um, the opportunity a few years, years ago, we, we built a house. And I did a little bit of carpentry work and construction work in my younger days, and now I, I, I still play around with a hammer and a nail once in a while, but I have to do everything twice because I never, you know, I cut it twice and it's still too short. It's all, it, 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 it never comes out to right. But um, watching our house get built, we had the land purchased, and the first thing that came out was the, was the excavator, and he dug that deep hole, and then the guys came and they laid that block wall around. What's that block wall called? It's called the foundation. You have to start with the foundation. And here, the foundation is the gospel of the kingdom and it's built upon a rock. Who's the rock? It's Jesus Christ. It's His, te- it's his teaching there. And that house was built and, and the foundation, and the foundation is where you have to start. And the foundation, he says over in Corinthians, is Jesus Christ and there's no other foundation can be laid than any man laid. But we were there... We watched the foundation. The foundation is this big hole in the ground with these cement blocks around the outside edge. And they didn't start building on top of the foundation. You know where they started? They started in the foundation. Those guys, there were six or eight guys that went down in there and they they had some pads. They uh, poured concrete pads and they they had to set some posts and they had... A couple dozen two by tens that they nailed together and they had to put some beams that stretched across the span before they could build upon the foundation. And it was, you know, those, those beams are, are wandering back and forth and they get them, they get them kind of in position and then they, then they start putting the floor joists on and they tie all that stuff together and then they can build on top. You know, you, you start, you're going to start building, you got to be in the foundation before you're on the foundation. <laughs> and, but then they, 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 lay the, they lay those floor joists and then they begin to put up the framework and they put up the shell and, and the, 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 the stud walls and the, and the stairways and all the things are going up there and, and then they put the, put the walls up and then the rafters and then the, the, um, uh, the, the, the sheeting on and you built the, frame, the framework of the house. You, you can see the shell, you can see the shape and once the frame is up, then the plumbers can come and they begin to put the pieces in, inside. They begin, to, begin to, to, to put the plumbing and then the electricians come. And then, they, then the guys come and then they put the siding on. They put the roof on. And they put the windows in. So you build the framework and you have the shell. And then the, then the finishers come. And they begin to set up the house and they begin to, they begin to put all the, 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 the trim, the, the hardwood and the, 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 the sheetrock and the drywall and the painters and all those other things. And then the guys come in and they lay the carpeting. And what are they doing all that for? They're doing all of that so that the house can be lived in. And there's a, that whole process, there's an order and there's a structure to it. It's not enough, beloved, just to, to believe Paul's epistles. When we come to the instructions that he gives us here, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, there is a form and a shape to Paul's epistles, a form and a shape to maintain. He says, that good thing which is committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. There, there is a spiritual pattern to the message and the ministry of the Apostle Paul. So if you would, come with me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter number 1. And there's a, there's, a, there's a spiritual structure and a design and an order and a framework in building this house that the saints are to live in. And it's based on the, on the message and ministry of the Apostle Paul, but not just the message and ministry but the, the method and the approach that he takes. He writes the book of Romans, and we're, we're right here in the, in, the, in, the, in the very beginning. There's a spiritual order to Paul's epistles. Romans wasn't the first book that Paul wrote, but it stands at the head of, of Paul's epistles, those 13 letters, those 13 epistles, just like there's a spiritual order in the rest of your Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's a, there's a progression and an order in the Old Testament. The book of Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, those books are laid out. There's a progression and a spiritual order in those books. The book of Job was probably the first book in the Bible, but, but, but written, but, but placed in the Scripture at a different time. There's a spiritual order and a design to them. And when we come to our Bible... 
It is not just the words on the page, but God Almighty put this book together and put Paul's epistles together. And he writes the Romans, and the Romans is this great epistle, the foundation. And he desires to come and see them. He introduces the, the, um, the epistle and tells of his intentions to, to, to visit them. Romans chapter 1, verse 11. He says, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. What's the end game? The end is establishing the saints, getting the, the saints grounded and, and, and established and, and fixed and stable in their Christian life and in their function. He talks about the, in, in Timothy, he talked about the end of the commandment. What's the end goal? The end goal is perfecting the saints, bringing them up to maturity, bringing them to a, to a place of strength and, 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 and able to, to, to function. And in, in 11 and 12 here in Romans chapter 1, there's these wonderful, to me, this is one of the wonderful, most wonderful definitions of fellowship. He says, I long to see you, verse 11, that I may, may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. That is, what's the definition of establishment? That is, that I may be comforted together with you. Isn't that a beautiful definition of fellowship? Comfort together, having some truth imparted that comforts the saints together. Paul says, I want to be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. You know what fellowship is? You know what establishing is? Having the same viewpoint that the Apostle Paul had. You're going to be, we're going to be comforted together and established when you, when we have this mutual understanding of the faith that, and that I have and you have together and we rejoice together in that truth. That's a beautiful definition. That's, and Paul is writing here to a local church. You know what fellowship is in the local church? It's not potluck. It can be. It's not just, just hanging out and coffee and donuts. It's being comforted together with the mutual faith and rejoicing together and doing the work of the ministry. And these Romans were. Their faith was spoken of throughout the, how, the, throughout the whole world. Wonderful truth. The end game is to be established in the faith. And as we come to the Scripture, the words are the issue. And God wrote some words and He preserved some words for us. But there's this marvelous order. And the goal is establishment. Come, come with me to Romans chapter 16. There is a way that the Apostle Paul did the work of the ministry. Um, Romans chapter number, number 16. You're familiar with the verse here. Romans chapter 16 verse 25. The Apostle Paul says, Now to him that is a power to establish you. Notice, the, notice the, the three things here in verse 25 and 26. Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel. And number two, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. And number three, by the scriptures of the prophets. According to, now here's that commandment that pops up again. Remember we saw that over in Timothy? Paul was an apostle by the commandment of Jesus Christ. Here he says that you're a power, that, that, that you can be established according to my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. There is a structure that starts with God as he lays all these things out. There are three things in the passage here. You're established, number one, by my gospel. Paul's gospel of the grace of God. Now, when he says, my gospel, his distinctive ministry. Did Paul originate the gospel of grace? No. He got it from the Lord Jesus Christ. And that sounds, all, that, that sounds awful braggadocious. It sounds awful assertive. Doesn't it? Do you know anybody else in the Bible that talks like that? Come with me. Come back to the book of Deuteronomy with me quickly. Deuteronomy chapter number, number 11. There's an illustration back here of, of this verse. Deuteronomy chapter number 11. Paul was an apostle according to the commandment of, of, of God and he had a ministry according to the commandment of God to, 
And he commits that to Timothy. Moses, back in Deuteronomy chapter number 11. Moses says, verse 13, And it shall come to pass, if you shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day to love the Lord your God and to serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul. Is Moses talking about his gospel? Uh, his gospel? His, did he originate it? No, he was the vehicle. He was the vehicle that was raised up, the human instrument that was given the authority to dispense the law to the nation of Israel. We have no problem, do we, talking about the law of Moses. Moses' law. Well, whose law was it? It was God's law. And he says, hearken diligently unto my commandments. Do you know that, that the same kind of language is used by, about Moses? Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter number 4. Moses was raised up according to the commandment of God. He says, um, Deuteronomy chapter number 4. Deuteronomy chapter number 4 and verse 5. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God did what? Commanded me. Did Moses have divine authority? He absolutely did. And it was divine authority directly from God. And it was the law of Moses. But who was, who were the nation of Israel accountable? They were accountable to that law of Moses. But it was God's law. When we talk about Paul's gospel, and we, when Paul says, my gospel, we need the rest of Romans chapter 16, verse 26 there. He says, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. It was God himself. That commissioned the Apostle Paul to go out with his distinctive message. Was it not? Was it not? Absolutely. So there's, there's this gospel that God gave to the Apostle Paul. The gospel, the good news. Now the book of Mark opens up in Mark chapter number 1. It says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, doesn't it? And it says, as it is written in the prophets, not Isaiah, but the prophets. You know the verse. And so the gospel of Mark presents the Lord Jesus Christ according to prophecy. And what was the subject of Jesus Christ in prophecy? He was Israel's Messiah and he was going to be Israel's king and Israel's redeemer. And he was going to establish that kingdom of heaven on the earth, the days of heaven. And the Lord, the good news of God centers on Jesus Christ. And there's Jesus Christ in prophecy. But Paul says, my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Paul's gospel presented the Lord Jesus Christ in his death and his burial and his resurrection and the details of that, was, didn't it? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I delivered unto you that, first of all, which I received, how that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. Did the book of Mark or Matthew or Luke or John, did they present the good news of Jesus Christ in his death and his burial and his resurrection? Not, not presented to Israel that way, did it? Paul's gospel takes Jesus Christ and presents the good news of his cross work. And then he says the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it was according to the Scriptures, wasn't it? It was in harmony with the Scriptures. You could go back in the Old Testament and you could find the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ shadowed in, the, in, in Isaiah 53, in Psalm 22, and, and other places. So you see it back there. But, and it was according with the, to the Scriptures. But here Paul says, My gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but is now made manifest. There's some things about Jesus Christ and some things that Jesus Christ was going to accomplish that was the unsearchable riches of Christ. Wealth that was never told. It's unsearchable. It was kept secret because it was hid where? In God. And made known eventually to the Apostle Paul. So there's some things about Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ was going to accomplish for God the Father that had been kept secret. And then he says in verse 26, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets. These three things here, the scriptures of the prophets, is the rest of the word of God. The scriptures, not just Paul's gospel and, and the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the revelation of the mystery and the church, the body of Christ and, and its purpose and its, and its future out there in the ages to come. 
But there was some more. The, the, the rest of the Word of God, the Scriptures of the prophets, the prophets took the, to the Scriptures and put them together for us. And there's these three categories, three levels of truth that Paul says will lead to the establishment of believers <coughs> that will enable them to be comforted by their mutual faith together. And it'll establish, it'll produce stability. And these are sound words. These wonderful things here with the, with the gospel of the grace of God. Here is the design of Paul's ministry. Here is the form that he followed. He got people saved and he would bring them to the knowledge of the truth. And there is this wonderful principle in God's word. He says there in verse 26, it's according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. That's that commandment that Paul gave Timothy, that, Timothy's, that Timothy was to keep and to hold and to guard. He says in 1 Timothy 6, I charge thee that thou keep this commandment without spot and unrebukable till the, till the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ shows who's the only blessed and, 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 uh, and potentate. There's that command. There is a commandment to keep today, beloved. And it's the commandment that God gave to the Apostle Paul. And there's a form to that commandment. And the way those things are laid out, there is a wonderful spiritual design in Paul's epistles and the way they are laid out. Um, he says here in Romans chapter 16, verse 20, 25, first of all, he says, according to my gospel. Go over to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. And as Paul arrives at Corinth, he gives us an indication of, of something here. He says, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, verse 2, And I, brethren, when I came unto you, came not unto you with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him, what? Crucified. Paul goes into to Corinth and he preaches Christ and Him crucified. The gospel. I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day. Look over in chapter 3, what he, how he describes his ministry as he goes into, into Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual... But as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. What do you feed children? You feed them milk, right? What do you, what do you feed? You, feel, you don't feed them meat, you feed them milk. That gives them strength, it, it, it gives them calcium, and, and they need that at that point in their life. Paul here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, as he goes down to, and, and describes his ministry... He says, I've fed you with milk in verse 2. Verse 6, I have planted and Apollos watered. He says, we're laborers together with God in verses 9 and 10. He says in verse 10, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the what? The foundation. Well, what's the foundation that he had already laid there in Corinth? Christ and Him crucified. And isn't it amazing? It's wonderful as we look at as we look at the order of Paul's epistles and the way these books are laid out in our Bible. There is this wonderful, marvelous design that he says, When I came to Corinth and I came among you, I came and I preached unto you Christ and Him crucified. What stands at the head of Paul's epistles? The book of Romans. The book of Romans lays the foundation of Paul's gospel and the truth of Christ and, and Him crucified. And there's the, the, the wonderful truths that are there. So Paul laid the foundation. You have the book of Romans that lays the foundation. Then you have two, two books. You have First and Second Corinthians, which are reproof and correction, just like Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All Scripture is profitable for doctrine, there's the doctrine of the cross in the book of Romans. It's profitable for reproof. There's the book of 1 Corinthians, reproving the conduct of the Corinthians. The Corinthians weren't living like saved people. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction. What comes after the books of 1 and 2 Corinthians? The book of 
Galatians. And you have these, this wonderful cluster of books. Romans lays the foundation. You have First and Second Corinthians that are reproof and repentance. The Corinthians made some progress. And the book of Galatians, that's correction. You're here in First Corinthians. As Paul came to the, came to the, to the, to the Corinthians, he, he could only preach unto them milk. He could only lay the foundation because they weren't able to bear any further other, any further truth. Look at 1 Corinthians here, chapter 2, verse number 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6. Howbeit, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world nor the princes of this world, but we speak the wisdom of God and a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. What was the condition of the Corinthians? They were babes. Could he give them meat? and solid food and more advanced doctrine and, and, and deeper truth. No, they were carnal. He had to give them the foundational issues of Christ and Him crucified. Did Paul have other ministry? He says, verse 6, Howbeit, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. There's the contrast to the infants and the childhood of the Corinthians compared to other believers that had taken the truth and gone on and grown in their understanding. What's this wisdom among them that are perfect? He says, verse, verse 7, We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. There's the mystery, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Did the glory program for the church, the body of Christ, was that laid out back there in the Old Testament? Was that something that people could, could search out and find? It was hidden, wasn't it? It was not made known. God's purpose for the church, the body of Christ, and the glory in the heavenly places, and, and the things for the ages to come for us is not made known back there. For had the mystery been revealed back there, Satan would have found plan B and would have done something other than what he did. That's great proof that the mystery was kept secret, wasn't it? But you see how Paul had one level of truth that he started the believers with, the milk and Christ and Him crucified, and then he would take them on to the more advanced issues of, of the, the, the glory which God has foreordained for us after the book of Romans and First and Second Corinthians and Galatians. You have another doctrinal book. You have the book of Ephesians. And the book of Ephesians builds on top of the foundation. The book of Ephesians is the framework. You have the foundation, Christ and Him crucified, but then you begin to put up the superstructure and you begin to see what this house is going to look like And it's because some people are going to live in this house and function there. And the books of Ephesians... You have the Ephesians, a doctrinal book about the, about the, the church, the body of Christ, and the ages to come, and the, the glorious future that God has planned for us. Then you have the book of Philippians and Colossians. Philippians talks about the, 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 uh, the issue of reproof and, and the mind of Christ being pro, uh, present in a local assembly. Then the book of Colossians uh, is correction. Uh, uh, for them to be holding the head. And you have this wonderful pattern that begins to develop. Romans is the foundation for First and Second Corinthians and Galatians. And then the book of Ephesians, another doctrinal book about the church, the body of Christ. And then Philippians and Colossians, commentaries on the book of Romans, written about the same time. Romans and Corinthians and Galatians were early epistles written, written in Paul's, during Paul's Acts ministry. Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians written later after he's a prisoner in Rome. So you see this wonderful progression in the way the books are laid out in our Bible. What comes after um, the book of Philipp books of Philippians and Colossians? You have the, the finish. You have the end of the dispensation of grace. And the, the, the truth of the, of, the, of the rapture and the revelation. You have Paul taking the believers at Thessalonica there. And, and in that, in that uh, presentation, he begins to orient them in addition to the things he taught them initially, orient them to the rest of the Word of God and their exit from planet Earth and the close of the dispensation of grace and the prophetic program as it's laid out and the, the exit of the church, the body of Christ, the rest of the Word of God. All of a sudden, you see those things wonderfully unfolding. It's a beautiful and a wonderful design. What comes after the books of First and Second Thessalonians? 
You have the books of First and Second Timothy, Titus and Philemon. You have the issue of the local church and the mystery of godliness and the way the church, the body of Christ, is to function and to operate as a, as a local church family. A wonderful principle and a wonderful design. Do you see the form in that? God didn't just take, he, you know, Rodney was talking about the fishbowl with the, with the scripture verses in it and reaching in and taking a, taking a verse and, oh, here's a good one. And, oh, we're going to take, it, it, it's not a haphazard process. God laid those things out. He put, he put the, 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 the scripture down in, in, the, in the word of life, but he put it together the way he wanted it and the way he wanted us to assimilate it and, and to build it into our lives. And you see this wonderful design here in God's Word. The book of Romans lays the foundation of of God's grace. And the, the book of Romans takes the believer and puts him in Christ, believing the gospel of the grace of God. And it puts him in Christ by the grace of God. It puts him under grace, not the law. And it teaches him how to live in the dispensation of grace based on the cross work of Jesus Christ. It's this wonderful foundation you have to be, you have to lay the foundation, you have to be in the foundation, but then you begin to build upon the foundation. And you see those wonderful, wonderful truths begin to unfold. After the book of Romans, you have the books of Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians. Go there with me. Go to Ephesians chapter number, um, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And he talks in verses 1, 2, and 3 about our, our condition being as Children of Adam's lost and dead in trespasses and sins. Verse number four, but God. Aren't you glad the but God's in the Bible? But God, who is rich in mercy for His great love, wherein He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. There's the book of Romans. That's Romans truth. You get saved, you're, you're, you're made, you're given new life in Christ Jesus, you're, you're buried with Him in, in baptism, you're risen to walk in newness of life, and you're quickened together with Jesus Christ. And there's the, the foundational truth of, of the book of Romans. He, you back up to, Rome, to Ephesians chapter number 1, as he talks about the predestination of the believer that Rodney spoke about. He says in verse number 7, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. There's the Romans truth already just alluded to in the book of Ephesians. But the book of Ephesians now takes the believer who is now in Christ and shows that he's part of something bigger. He's part of the church which is his body and there's some glory ordained for us before the foundation of the world which none of the princes of this world knew. And it's special and it's wonderful. And he goes, go back to Ephesians chapter number 2, verses 4 and 5. There's Romans truth. His great love, when we were sinners, Christ died for us. Even verse 5, when we were dead in trespasses and sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. And then what's the first word of verse 6? And he's raised us up to walk in newness of life like the book of Romans. No, he says, you're raised with Jesus Christ now to sit in, to sit in the heavenly places in the ages to come. And he's going to show some exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward you. He builds upon the foundation of the book of Romans. Romans puts you in Christ, in the church, the body of Christ. But the book of Ephesians takes the body of Christ and puts it in the heavenly places for the ages to come. And there's this wonderful progression And now you get over into the books of Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians, and it's all about perfecting the saints. Uh, Go to to Philippians chapter 3. The uh, Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians are about perfected saints and saints that are grounded and and established in doing the work of the ministry. Philippians chapter chapter number 3, he talks about wanting to know Jesus Christ. And pressing toward that mark for the prize of the of the calling of God in Christ Jesus. He says in verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You learn about that in Ephesians. You learn about the the walking worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. And then he says, let us therefore as many as be perfect. Here's some saints that are, that are not just babes and, and carnal, but they've grown and they're matured. And there's, a, there's even a progression in Paul's epistles. There's this wonderful progression in the form of sound words. 
Then you come, come, come with me to the book of, uh, of 1 Thessalonians. The Thessalonian believers, they, they, they got it, and they're, they're, uh, they're operating under grace. They're standing for the message and, 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 and living. And here in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, Paul begins to talk about the exit and how the church, the body of Christ, will leave this, leave the, and how the dispensation of grace will come to a close. He says in 1 Thessalonians chapter number um, 1, verse 10, to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. We learn about this, this exit, and the, the church, the body of Christ, comes to a conclusion. Come to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. There's the actual passage about the, 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 the description of the event, verses 13 through 17. And he, he, he teaches and communicates those informa- that information through the written word of God. Look at verse 18. What does he say? Wherefore, do what? Comfort one another with these words. What was the definition of fellowship? To be comforted together with the mutual faith, both of you and me. Here's the hope of the, of the believer. This comforting together. And these epistles are, are written to local churches for them to function. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He says in verse uh, 11, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And was, we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among themselves. Here he begins to talk about order and structure and leadership in the local church. You have the rest of the Word of God. The Thessalonians learned some things about the prophetic program. They were not going to, the day of the Lord wasn't going to overtake them. Um, and you come to the, to the issue of the, of the local church now. And you come over to 1 Thessalonians chapter number, number 5, verses 11 and 12 and 13 there. And Paul begins to discuss how this truth is to, is to operate within the local assembly. You come to 1, Thessal- 1 Timothy. Then you have these epistles about the local church laid out for us. 1 Timothy chapter number 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by what? The commandment of God. God commissioned the apostle Paul. He gave him a message. He gave him a form of sound words. He commissioned him to go out and preach and proclaim that. And he laid out in our Bible the pattern that the Apostle Paul followed in ministry. I tell you, when you, put, when you take God's word and you build it together God's way, it does tremendous work in your life. Rodney talked about the FOD class when he saw that circle and the fall of the nation of Israel. I remember the time chart taking a kid who had grown up in, in church and had put the whole Bible together. And I finally could, I could finally distinguish between the rapture and the second coming. I was always confusing that as a kid. But you know, it was back in the early 80s that I began to sit down with, with Brother Jordan and we developed a friendship and he showed me this, this structure and this order and the design in Paul's epistles and how Romans lays the foundation of my gospel and Corinthians and Galatians build on that found, uh, uh, commentaries on the book of Romans and then Ephesians comes along with advanced information and begins to, to, to take the church, the body of Christ and put it in the heavenly places and Philippians and Colossians are commentaries on the book of Ephesians and how Thessalonians takes the exit and takes the church, the body of Christ, off the planet and and orients the believer to the rest of the Word of God. And then you have the local church laid out for us and the structure in the pastoral epistles. And this design did for me with Paul's epistles what the chart did for me with the whole Word of God. And I remember going back and I, for, for, for several months and, and for years since, began read, reading Paul's epistles. I would read them through once a week while I was at work and, 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 and see that design and, and it transformed my life. Seeing not just Paul was my apostle and the dispensational distinctions, but the progression of thought and the perfection of the saints to do the work of the ministry. There's a form of sound words and he says we're to hold. Go back to 2 Timothy. Let's quit. 2 Timothy 
chapter number 1, 2 Timothy chapter number 1, verse 13. Here's this message, but he says in verse number 13, this form of sound words, he says, hold fast the form of sound words. When he tells Timothy to preach the word over in 2 Timothy, he's telling Timothy to preach not just Paul's apostleship, but preach the form of sound words. And when you take this message and you build it together, you know what it, what it, what it does? It develops a truly Pauline viewpoint that, that many in the grace movement missed for years and years. Because as they come along, they see the distinctions of, of Paul's gospel and, and right division, but they bring a lot of their traditional baggage and different things with them about prayer and about the will of God and about how God chastens and about how God leads and all those circumstantial stuff. And I remember as we were going through the school back in the, in the mid-80s, we began, to, we began to see that we were missing some things because as we, as we grew to the, to the, to the end of, of, of grade school, the Bible, we began, to, we began to realize we weren't being consistent. But this doctrine had developed in us a truly consistent Pauline viewpoint, and we let Paul describe for us the will of God. We let Paul teach us about prayer. We let Paul t- teach us about how he leads the believer in life today. And boy, it began to, it began to transform, uh, and it brought us into the, what we call the, the grace alternative doctrines that have taken us beyond a lot of the circumstantial uh, things, and it's, it, it's healthy, <laughs> healthy sound words. He says here, hold fast. I want to finish. Go to the book of Acts, chapter number 27. Acts, chapter 27. I love, I love when the Bible gives illustrations about what it means to, to do things, how it defines its own terms. There's a wonderful reference over here in the book of Second, uh, in, the, in the book of Acts, chapter number 27. You know, this is Paul's voyage uh, to Rome. And at the close, they had the shipwreck. Acts 27, verse 41, he says, And falling into a place where the two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the forepart stuck, what? Fast. And remained, what? Unmovable. And the hinder part was broken with the violence of the wave. We need to hold fast the form of sound words and be unmovable. There's a lot of people that get moved away through fads, doctrinal issues, deviating from, from things where they have to give up this form of sound words and the things that we hold near and dear. May we, as we hold forth the word of life, hold the form of sound words that we receive from the Apostle Paul. Amen? Father, thank you for your, your word. We thank you for the wonderful truth of it. When we approach the scripture and we look at the words on the page and we, uh, we, we see the details and the light that's there, Lord, we, we know that you don't just give us to, to flounder and, and pick and choose, but there's a pattern to follow in our ministry. And as we do that, Lord, it perfects the saints and it edifies and it builds up a house that people can live in and function. It builds the house of God and demonstrates the mystery of godliness today in the dispensation of grace. We thank you so much for that.